We live in a world where there is more access to information than ever before. Generations, young and old, are being exposed to radically different ideologies and opinions every day. It can be so overwhelming trying to decipher what's true and what's false, but there is a way. Join me as we discuss some of the toughest questions out there about Christianity, the Bible, and culture. I'm your host, Nick Lackey. Welcome to The Garrison. Welcome everyone to another episode of The Garrison. I'm super excited because today we have my good friend Andre Tompkinson with us, and he is going to be sharing with us his testimony and about how he became a Christian. So uh, we'll get straight into it. Andre, very quickly before I start asking you questions, uh, why don't you tell us how old you are and where you're from? I am 19 and I'm from Christchurch. My mum is from Moldova, for all of you who know where that is, next to Ukraine and Romania, for you who didn't, but yeah. Awesome. And uh, I'll just briefly say that, you know, Andre and I, we kind of knew each other, although Andre is 19 as well as me, he was the year below me in high school, and we kind of knew each other through high school, we had a mutual friend, uh, and I guess we, we started playing indoor football together, actually, but you only became a Christian at the start of this year in February. And when you did, it was like a, a light bulb went on. Like I uh, noticed the change straight away. I won't spoil the testimony too much, but since then we have been uh, great friends, even better Rocket League partners. Um, and that's actually how we got to know each other quite well. But uh, yeah, so Andre, uh, the first question or thing I want to discuss with you is, you know, going back to the time when you weren't a Christian, what was life like? You know, uh, maybe give us a bit of a, back, a background on, you know, what kind of household you were raised in what interactions you had with God, uh, what was your relationship with, like with your parents, that kind of thing. But yeah, right. go, go ahead. So I was I was born and raised church family, Christian family. They went to church every week, go to youth group, do everything you'd expect a Christian to do. But never thought of it in a deeper way when I was younger. So like, it didn't really catch on. But then... Um, also, yeah, I was just like, after growing up a bit, I was I was living in that family and that lifestyle, kind of thought I was a Christian, but like I would call myself, but there was no fruit to show yeah. that. So would you say that you believed in God, but you probably didn't really have a relationship with him? Mm, yeah, mm. yeah. So I never actually thought of it as a relationship. I just yeah. thought of it as stories and like, more of a fairy tale in that sense because I'd right. never actually give it that deep, true understanding that it deserved. And yeah, so grew up there, went to school, non Christian schools, well, even Christian schools and yeah, yeah. non Christian nowadays. But um yeah, so it was difficult growing up with that and then the change it was like all kind of sparked to me like it was something I was missing out on. Yeah slowly kind of got into that didn't really fully get into it because they were mm. already went to england for a couple of years they were already very into it partying drugs all that but at that time didn't really appeal to me are these Still, your, your friends you're talking about yeah They're getting into all that stuff yeah. yeah and it was like some of them were like 13 years old and i was just like what is happening they'd just be smoking weed on the streets and like yeah. it was a bit crazy but then yeah it didn't appeal to me at that time but Came back to Christchurch later on, Kashmir around year 12. Everything like, well, the, everything the world had to offer kind of started to appeal to me. Mm. Smoking weed, drinking, partying, getting with girls, all these like different things. Yeah. Especially when you like grow up, you realize how much there actually is going around and like what everyone's actually doing. So I thought just fit in. Yeah. Got mates, surrounded myself with mates that did weed, yep. drinking, all that was just normal. We'd do it, what, sometimes like five times a week, just smoking, missing classes, never would do that. Like, yeah. As, as a young child, so I just really saw it developing in my life, but I didn't see it. I, it was just a normal thing to me. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and what would you say would be the, the thing you kind of lived for at this time? You know, what was the highlight of your week or what kept you going right so it'd be the main thing would be spending ma time with mates yeah. smoking weed <laughs> that'd be like the main highlight that i would take also loved sports always have loved sports so that's always a highlight i always look 
forward to sports, but yeah, it wasn't really anything else apart from those two things, really. Mm -hmm. And and how would you describe your attitude towards, uh, let's say, your parents, for example, or just maybe uh, even while you're playing sport, you know, what was your attitude like with these kind of people? Yeah. Uh, With parents, it was like pretty bad. They would... It was difficult as well when my mum went to England. It was just me, my dad, in the house for a while. So that was quite difficult. Never like experienced that before. But I just felt as the as I started smoking more weed, I'd become a lot more selfish. Yeah. Not helping around the family, not going out my way to really give someone a hand, help someone in my family, not really being thankful for what they were laying down for me as well, the sacrifices they were making. Mm-hmm. And then, as you said, like on the sports field, it was I'd be I'd be cheeky. I loved stirring people, yeah, getting on their nerves, seeing how far I could really push them till they're like swearing at me, yelling at me, like trying to take me out. I kind of enjoyed that, but it just really was something. But yeah, I just I didn't even think of it. I just thought of it as a bit of fun. But yeah, it really stirred some people mm-hmm. up, like liked getting into nearly fights and all that just yeah getting ready for that but nothing too much ever really came out of that yeah so you kind of you grew up in a christian household you had uh parents who would take you to church and you had this kind of belief in god although you didn't have a relationship with him and then did you say it was about year 12 for you when things started you know you were getting into drugs and alcohol and um as you mentioned before was it that time yeah obviously other things as well like obviously got introduced to everyone's watching pornography yeah. everyone's masturbating i like i heard about it earlier i was like what like i kind of to fit in i was like yeah i do do yeah. that you know but mm-hmm. like i didn't even really think about it and then obviously when that started to appeal to me as i started to mature and develop i yeah got quite addicted to that yeah like watch a lot of it it's so easy to as well Mm -hmm. to the sense where i'm just like blocking my conscious out and just doing what i wanted whenever i wanted yeah every day an interesting point i'll make and this can happen to anyone like christian or not is with our conscience you know i've once heard it described as you know let me know if you relate to this but i've once heard it described as being like your pain senses and that if you smack your thumb with a hammer it's going to hurt, right? If you're trying to get a nail in and you smack your thumb, it's going to hurt quite a lot. But if you continue to do so, you keep whacking your thumb over and over and over and over again, eventually your thumb will start to lose feeling in it, right? Mm. And then you're not going to be able to feel when you're hitting your thumb or not because you've just absolutely yep. obliterated it. And I feel like, you know, this is so true for our conscience is that, and the Bible speaks of this as well, that we can dull our conscience. And so, I mean, would you say that's something that happened to you? Yeah. You were just dulling your conscience? Through definitely, all the, all the definitely. Stuff? And you, it's not even about suppressing the truth at that point because people talk about suppressing the truth and how you know, well, the deeper conscience and what, why we actually have that and why we feel guilty about certain things. Yeah. <clears throat> it wasn't even really suppressing that because you can suppress that and hide that from yourself. But it was more just not dwelling on that at all just as you said keep hitting my hitting my thumb with that hammer till Mm. it was just really yeah yeah and you can do that with any sin but yeah it's easy to do with pornography and things like that so and how long did this phase of your life go on for from when you kind of started getting into all the uh well i mean obviously you know we've been sitting our whole life but this this period where you were getting into all of these things um started in year 12 so was that a a two-year thing three-year thing how how long did Um, it go for yeah i would say started around year 12 maybe end of like year 11 ish yeah so and then till the end of year 13 so what two years two full years of just fully fully going at sin like giving it all i could and just finding the most pleasures i could from sin right Uh and just yeah really loving it and thinking this is the life i wanted to live but wasn't gaining anything of it was just losing and was just yeah it was just destroying me but i didn't even want to dwell in it so Mm -hmm. i didn't even know what it was doing to me and how it was affecting me until yeah recently when i've been changed yeah and if you don't mind like was there a point during this two three year period where 
there was just a, like you'd hit rock bottom or there was just one moment where you'd really uh, noticed everything or maybe this was at the end towards when you became a Christian or and and, and the other thing is like how was your mental health this whole time right. you know, what was going on there that's good yeah so at the start I was I was still happy still happy chappy for the first like year or so and then yeah. when when you, it starts becoming a real problem and something that's happening every day in your life it really starts to actually kick in for you and mental health is just something yeah it started progressively just getting worse and worse until mm -hmm. I realized like life was pointless for me it was purposeless meaningless yeah. and I was just doing what everyone else was doing and realizing it was actually giving me no true satisfaction or pleasure from it just temporary yeah and it was just like really affecting me in that way because I didn't want to think about it but I was still doing it and it was still affecting my mental health mm. in that way so I was yeah I got to the point sometimes where I'd be like do I want to kill myself mm. like I never would actually have gone through with it but yeah it was just like to that point where I was yeah hurting myself yeah. mentally to that point where you're thinking about yeah. that yeah and, and mm. you're starting to ponder those questions and I think that's so I mean often our culture and society talks about this mental health crisis particularly among our generation right mm. and i think you know naturally when we're hurting we seek pleasures and stuff to um be like a cure for our hurt but mm. so often it just becomes so much worse and you know I, I had friends who they weren't christians however there was one friend i remember explicitly who came to me and said look nick we we're not christians we're not really that interested but the one thing that really kind of gets us is that if there is no God, why don't we just go kill ourselves right now? Now, they weren't depressed or anything, but they were saying if there's no God, there's no afterlife, there's no purpose or point of life. They had come to the realization, which, of course, I had come to as well, but as a Christian uh, and from a Christian point of view, that you know, if God is not real, then any sense of purpose or meaning or uh, worth is all just some sort of fairy tale it's an imagination or, or it's just subjective right mm, just mm. how you feel ultimately there is no objective purpose or meaning in life and you know people will often say well just live life to the fullest then enjoy it as much as you can and naturally if you add on top of that if you add that there is you know if there's no god there's no moral compass then you're going to seek whatever pleasure you can regardless of whether you think it's right or wrong which is why we see so many people uh, young people delving into pornography, uh, mm. fornication, drugs, masturbation, um, you know, vaping, all, all this, all this stuff that you could, you know, you could possibly mm. think of that would become pleasurable to someone. And I think that's why we're seeing such a crisis: is that people just seek you know, pleasure to be their cure. And people are realizing, you know, we're living in. I did a po my first ever podcast was on the decline of Christianity in the West and. You see, as the decline in people who are believing in an objective standard, um, an objective purpose and meaning, naturally what's going to happen? People are going to become more depressed. And um, yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing that because I mm. think it's so relevant and happens to so many people. Yeah. 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 It's getting more and more common. And what you're saying about just before about like without God, there's no true purpose and yeah. it's all just subjective. It's just like who's who's saying what Hitler was doing was wrong, right? Yeah. It could just be survival of the fittest. Like, if we were monkeys, like, who's saying that's wrong if it's all just subjective? So there's actual no, as you were saying, moral compass of that to actually mm -hmm. decide. But as the Ten Commandments give us a moral compass to truly see, like, the moral law, what we yeah. can live off. Yeah, and that's cool. Anyway, I, I think that's really good that you've kind of um, laid the foundation for what your life was like and, and where you were heading. And what your mental space was like, mm. Dre, because, um, you know, it's probably cliche, but often, you know, people say the light shines brightest in the dark. And so um, I want to get on to now, you know, when you did become a Christian, which was earlier this, this year. So I guess, how, how did that happen? You know, you were in this, you were in this pit, you were, you know, thinking about killing yourself, mm. not, as you mentioned, not that you were actually going to do it, mm. but, you know, you're starting to ponder these questions. So what was it that that changed you know it just well it was over a lot of things yeah. over a lot of times as as people will tell you mm -hmm. god doesn't wish for anyone to go to hell he'll show you many examples of his cre through his creation through many different things of how 
you can have a life with him. I never actually pondered it at the time, but things would just build up. Why do I feel guilty? Why do, like, all these different questions would just keep coming to me and, like, why do I feel a sense of purposeless, um, purposeless, mm. meaningless, just living through my life? So I just really pondered throughout to the point where, as some people say, a stone in the shoe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it would get keep getting bigger and bigger and it turned into a rock where I was like, wow, like, I really have to be doing something about it. And so I was smoking weed, had some bad experiences because I just couldn't get this out of my head. It was yeah. just my conscience keep throwing it throwing it in my face where I just had to face it and then yeah I just truly came to the point of yeah I'm just trying to fill a void within myself trying to find worth in all these different things that the world says to find your worth in right and it just wasn't working it wasn't doing anything for me it wasn't achieving anything it was only bringing me down in mental mental state physical state motivational it was just yeah all negative in the long run maybe pleasurable in the time but yeah. yeah it's it's what it it doesn't actually give you anything and then just um truly came to that point where I was like yeah I need to I need to like face God now mm-hmm. like if he's real and I knew it was real and I just suppressed that you know yeah and for my whole life I like began to suppress that more and more and then I was like yeah I now face this I faced it, um, actually went to my mum, I'm like, yeah, God's showed me all these signs in my life, and I can't ignore it anymore, and mm. yeah, I, I was just crying, I was like, I need to, I need to repent, I repented, I, I was so thankful that Jesus actually died for me, like, mm. just thinking about, it didn't hit me at the start, because I was just like, so happy to actually be saved, of what he actually died for and what that actual price was for me to be redeemed and to be saved that didn't hit me at the time but over the time of being a christian it's hit me more and more but at that time it was just like um so thankful that i could be saved and actually have a savior and like truly be saved from the pit that i just kept digging myself in and god actually offered a way out of that and has made a way and it just yeah (laughs) gets me every time so so is that in february yeah yeah february this year wow two days before my birthday and then i know a big sin like i felt i needed to repent for was on february the 6th one day before my birthday so i felt it like truly coming to light then and then february the 7th i was just like in awe of god's creation i went to the beach i was i was really sick at this time because as soon as i said this to my mum about you know, like God's revealed these things to me. I need to repent, and I was I was truly sorry, sorrowful for my sins. Um, it started the real bad sickness. Like I couldn't barely eat. It just hit me, and um, it was actually really good that happened. You wouldn't you wouldn't <laughs> think it, but yeah. um, it made me ponder a lot of things, and God revealed a lot of things to me through that. And uh, yeah, it really got me thinking about the truth and like what I was doing with my life, how I was treating people, especially my parents being selfish, um, just living for me, 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 Mm -hmm. looking for what I can get, for what I can do, for what's best for me. But then, yeah, it just really hit me. There's so much more to it. And that God, yeah, he slowly started revealing that to me. It was pretty powerful. Oh, cool. So, I mean, I I heard about you becoming a Christian through, I think I was down in Queenstown at the time, but... um, you know, I think your mum shared a testimony at church and then I heard about it uh, through that and then I think you messaged me that same week that you'd become a Christian and you had said, hey Nick, I heard you run a street evangelism group um, right. on, a, on a Saturday. You know, I was wondering when that is and can I come out? And you know, in all honesty, I was quite surprised and I shouldn't have been surprised because if you think about it logically, when someone becomes a Christian, and they've just had all their sins paid for, mm. and they've repented and put their trust in Christ. You know, you normally the a, a, a fair reaction would be to be filled with joy. You know, mm. just as if you've just been saved from falling off a cliff, you'd be very grateful and very joyful. And mm. um, it, so it makes sense that you thought, well, I've just had this incredible gift given to me that I've received through my faith in Him. I want to go share that with other people. Mm. 
And unfortunately, I don't think that this is really emphasized much in the church. I think a lot of the, a lot of the time, someone will become a Christian in a church, and then instead of allowing them to go uh, go out into the world and share their faith, we kind of shelter them for a wee bit. Mm. We think as the church, oh, we'll we'll nurture them a wee bit. We'll we'll bring them along to our Bible studies, and once they've got enough kind of Courage, base knowledge, yeah. and mm. you know, once we've kind of helped them plant their roots, then then they can go out into the world. But I don't think this is the example that Jesus gives us in Scripture. Mm. Many times when he performs a miracle, people go out straight away and they start to share the good news in their village or their or their town. And uh, I think, you know, Jesus, he, he mentions that he sent the disciples out as sheep among wolves. And mm. these disciples probably hadn't been going, you know, they weren't having their Bible studies and they weren't uh, off there getting, getting theology degrees. No, Jesus sent them and he promised he would be with them. And then they went out, right? Mm. And so it makes sense that when someone gets saved, that they should be going out straight away and sharing their testimony. And, and Dre, part of the reason I wanted to have you on the podcast is because your testimony is one of the most powerful things you can share. You know, often a, a big thing for me is you know, having discussions with people, like intellectual discussions with people about Christianity, looking at creation and, and um, intelligent design and trying to prove God's real uh, based off our intellect, but you, you can't argue with experience, right? Mm. I can't argue with what God has done in your life and change you, right? Now, many people will, um, but I'd say you can't argue with how God flipped your life around. So um, I'll, I'll stop talking and I want to <laughs> ask you, you know, how, how has God flipped your life around? And that's kind of more of a general question, but obviously, you know, you used to be in this a pit of doing uh, drugs, alcohol, living for yourself. And I mean, from my point of view, when I started hanging out with you and having our discipleship sessions on, on Rocket League, <laughs> you know, straight away, I noticed that you were a changed person. So mm. um, I'll share my perspective on that in a minute. But first, you know, what would you say changed straight away? Straight away. Thankfulness. Mm. Bing. Oh, but it's still every day. I've been so thankful. I'm just like, just thinking about how God, as the creator of the universe, wants to have a relationship with me yeah. and people of this world. It just and that I get actually get to be a part of his beautiful creation and that all his creation is good. Obviously fallen, but that it was all intended to be good and that I can be a part of that. It's just it just hits me every time and just for everything he actually provides me with. Especially with becoming a Christian, walking walking out in in my faith it was quite hard like telling friends and all that lost obviously a lot of friends but um just like god was always providing for me i'd i'd feel sick some days not be wanting to do some things but he would always just like give me the strength to actually go out and do these things to actually encourage me and it really it really hit me so i think thankfulness was definitely the biggest thing for me and then just so many other things actually came with it just um Obviously, with that, wanting to help out family, seeing how much they were actually doing for me and just, like, bringing it back to them, like, because parents would always go out their way for me to pay for me for different things and yeah. all this. And I just took it as it was. I didn't actually realise how much they were doing, how much they were spending, all this, the effort that people actually go through for you to be able to do things. And I was just, like... It just all started hitting me and like, just like, yeah, I can do the dishes. Like, mm. <laughs> I can I can help out a bit, you know, like vacuum, vacuum the house every once yeah. in a while. And I was, I was still like, um, yeah. And just like the big thing though was definitely like how Jesus just like paid for all my sins and redeemed me yeah. and bought me at a price and obviously it's a very expensive price like mm. a perfect this the son of god's life it, it just meant so much to me that he actually suffered the death and punishment that and suffering that i deserved for me to actually live it just oh it just really hit me yeah. out because there's nothing more powerful than that god himself humbling himself yeah. to be a human to suffer to not judge but to suffer that we can actually be saved from what we deserve, righteous yeah. ju judgment. But yeah. yeah, it just, oh, it just really hit me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I love that. I think it's so cool that you're 
that you acknowledge it and you emphasize how you you know you are hellbound right and mm. you've been you've been saved from that and every christian is like that as well myself included like i mean what's that song you know the highway to hell i guess we're all on the highway to hell but when we get redeemed from that then absolutely i think i think you summed it up great as well when you said thankfulness was one of the biggest things and i noticed that in you as well like when we used to get on our um discipleship sessions on on, on rocket league every time uh i'd get on and be like so Dre, how are you and you were just like bro i'm i couldn't be better eh and then i mean it's such a cool attitude to have such a like, fair enough, it's it's the right attitude mm. to have as well. When you know that you've been saved from an eternity in hell and that your debt has been paid, mm. no matter what we're going on, um, no matter what we're going through in life, that should be our attitude. Like, I couldn't be better. Because mm. ultimately, I mean, you can get so emotional about little stuff going in, going on in your life. And, you know, there, there are times to be um, obviously emotional and stuff, but no matter what is going on in life, we can always rejoice because our names are written in the book of life. And that's mm. what Paul talks about as well uh, in the New Testament. He says, we rejoice because our names are written in the book of life. And this is Paul who went through imprisonment, shipwrecks, um, being uh, people attempting to stone him to death. No matter what situation he was in, he could always be content and always rejoice. Not because God's made his life better now or mm. because he's having prosperity or because he's living a really fun and enjoyable life. No, he rejoiced because his name was written in the book of life. And that's what I love uh, that you pointed out as well, that, you know, that's what we can be thankful for. And I, that was the biggest thing I noticed about you and your character change was just that you had thankfulness. And I think thankful, thankfulness is so important, like ju just for your, your mental space as well. And you, you know, we talked a wee bit about um, the kind of mental health crisis in our generation at the moment, and mm. or just in the world in general. Um, and do you, do you want to talk a wee bit about how, you know, how did your mental health change? Because obviously, you, you know, you've gone from thinking those very dark thoughts to, mm. to I mean, tell us what's it like now. Well, I think the biggest thing was definitely thankfulness, because what the biggest problem probably was was I was looking at life is what I could actually get out of it, not anything more than that. So when things were going wrong, what would I do? I'd grumble, I'd complain, I'd always like go to a resort that it's not going my way. But then when I actually became thankful, I was so much more thankful. I, I didn't have time to complain or grumble because there was yeah. nothing to actually complain or grumble about on the larger scheme of things. And when you look at it from that bigger scheme and look at, our actual purpose and that we can be a part of God's creation and have a purpose with him, a relationship with him. It just, yeah, it just really showed that there's, there's no point wasting time complaining and yeah, grumbling. Yeah, cool. mm. So what would you say now, Dre, um, as we, as we draw to a close, what do you live for now? What is your number one purpose in life? All right. So I live to glorify God to praise him and everything I can do and be thankful to him for everything for it's the grace of God that I have all the things that I have and to also spread the gospel yeah. as I know as I know God can work in my life wretched sinner was lost was mentally ill was yeah just really broken but that he can make a broken situation so good yeah. and and his timing that he can really change someone's heart and that all we need to be doing is sowing seeds and that we can actually be a part of that that experience where someone's life might be changed for eternity yeah. and they have eternal life instead of eternal damnation just because he's using us to sow these seeds in people and he grows and he grows them in people's hearts and lives and it's just so amazing mm -hmm. to see that we can actually be a part of that huge movement. Yeah, no, mm. that's awesome. And And finally, what would you say to people who are in the situation that you used to be in. The situation where maybe they're looking for pleasures in drinking, drugs, sex, masturbation, whatever it may be. Mm. They are um, living a life of sin and trying to seek as much pleasure as they can. They're living for themselves. From your point of view, what do you want them to know and, and what would you say to them? Right. Um, biggest thing, it's a void that you'll never be able to fill. 
worth <laughs> any pleasures of the the world. There's only one person that can fill that, and that's Jesus, and he paid that price that can actually fill everything on this world and give us a true meaning and purpose and till you find that you'll never be satisfied with anything you'll always be searching for more and more maybe a bigger house maybe better car whatever it is materialistic maybe even spiritually like to the sense where you're searching for different spiritual things maybe like new age things mm. yeah just all that sort of stuff like researching in the wrong places but it's so simple and God makes that simple for us so everyone can actually understand what he's done for us and it's that we've sinned and that he's paid the price that we can actually have life and if you understand that and how serious sin actually is because something I would do as well when I was a non-Christian I would I would make my sin seem normal or compare right. it to other people like yeah. everyone else is masturbating everyone's doing it is the common phrase that mm. people would use to justify themselves like but is God God judging you on behalf of what you thought everyone else is doing or is he judging you on what you've done you know so yeah, you have to by his standard yeah you really have to take in consideration what you're actually doing why are you doing it is it good is it bad is it good in God's eyes and you just you really actually have to search for that and um yeah Fine. I think the main thing was truly wanting to find my purpose and meaning. That's where it started for the search, and then God showed himself to me. I think that was the main thing, not actually being satisfied with my sin and only wanting to live for that, but I wanted an actual purpose, and yeah, and then God reveals himself if you seek. Mm, yeah, and, and one thing I'd say if you're listening right now as well is that we shouldn't come and try Christianity out like an experiment, like another drug or another pleasure that we seek to fill. We don't want to come to Christianity in order to uh, you know, give us a high or give us a pleasure. We want to come to Christianity and to seek the Savior Jesus because we've understood that we've broken His standard like you've been saying. And once we've broken His standard, then ultimately we're, we're, we've got the, the wrath of God um, that abides on us and we need the Savior Jesus to forgive us. So don't come to Christianity to seek another pleasure or, or another high because if, if you do that, then eventually your old ways will probably creep back into it. But instead, mm. no, repent of your sin, which just means to turn from it, admit you're wrong, ask God for forgiveness and put your trust in Jesus. And like you're saying about this whole purpose and meaning thing, um, th there's a analogy I heard from C.S. Lewis who uh, we're both a great fan of, thanks to his Narnia books and, and many other works. But he talks about how, I, or I think it's C.S. Lewis, he talks about how you, if you try running a car on anything else that other, other than oh, what right, it's supposed yeah. to run on, you might get a few yards, you might uh, make it out of the gas station, but eventually you're going to break down, right? But if you put the right fuel in it, then then you'll be away laughing. And so I think... You know, we if we repent and we put our trust in Jesus to to be forgiven, then naturally what we're doing is we are now living the way that we were always supposed to live, uh, which is walking with God and seeking righteousness. And mm. and I think when that happens, then it's not like we have to even just try and find our specific purpose or meaning. We just know that we are made in the image of God. We have therefore we have infinite worth and value. We have a relationship with the creator of the universe mm. and he's given us a mission to go and make disciples of, of all nations, right? To go mm. and spread this good news to other people. And so then naturally, our purpose and meaning and stuff all gets filled because we're doing what we were designed and created to be doing. Just like, you know, we've got the right, we're running on the right gas, mm. we're running on the right thing. And so naturally that's going to happen. So I think that's that's so awesome. But um, yeah. No, thank you so much, Dre, for your time. Thank you for mm -hmm. sharing this with everyone. I really hope that, you know, if you're listening and you're in this position that Dre used to be in, and I mean, ultimately, we were all uh, in this in this place. It may have looked a wee bit different, but we were in this place where we were in rebellion to God. I really hope and pray that, you know, Dre's testimony can uh, really convict and challenge you. And and if you're not, if you're, if you're a Christian, if you're saved, I, I, I really pray as well that this will be a great encouragement for you because... I think it's so awesome how God has, has brought you back, right? I know lots and lots of people, including myself, were praying for you mm. and your salvation. 
and God has has brought you back. So I mean, that's that's the greatest thing, yeah. the greatest thing ever, when God brings a sinner back. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Dre, for your time. Thank you everyone for listening to the Garrison. This has been an awesome interview with Andre. We'll see you on the next one. Peace. <laughs>